The Glinica Bridge spans the placid water of the Havel River in Germany, connecting West Berlin to Potsdam. The bridge's stark, almost austere simplicity belies the great many human dramas that unfolded along its length during some of the most tense periods of the Cold War. It was on this very bridge, dubbed the Bridge of Spies, under the watchful eyes of two global superpowers, that a tension-filled prisoner swap took place on the 11th of February 1986. A crowd of journalists and TV crews gathered on the western side of the bridge to observe the spectacle. Standing on the bridge that day was Carl Kutcher, dressed in a Brooks Brothers suit and wearing expensive Gucci loafers. He was flanked by his equally well-dressed wife, Hanna Kutcher. Twenty years earlier, the Czechoslovakian nationals had fled to America to start a new life. As Soviet emigres, they set out to live the American dream. For Karl, this meant climbing the ranks of academia. For Hanna, it was a lucrative career in the diamond trade. Both had become naturalized US citizens. But all of this was a smokescreen. Karl was in fact a sleeper agent deployed by Czechoslovakian intelligence to spy on the United States. He achieved what no other before him had managed to infiltrate the CIA as an illegal Soviet spy. As they strode confidently across the bridge of spies to their freedom, American authorities could not help but feel that an American traitor had slipped through their fingers. This is the story of Karl and Hanna Kutcher, the last of the Cold War super spies. Karl Kucha was born on the 21st of September 1934 in Bratislava, the Slovak capital of Czechoslovakia. A nation still in its relative infancy, Czechoslovakia was formed through a union after the fall of the Habsburg Empire between Slovakia, Bohemia and Moravia. Karl was the son of Austrian-born Jaroslav. His mother, Irena, was Jewish. Czechoslovakia comprised a number of disparate people groups, but this notwithstanding, in the 1930s, the country was set to become a European industrial powerhouse. However, the rise of Nazism in Germany would bring a premature end to this hopeful outlook. With the German Führer nearly installed, anti-Semitism became rife in Czechoslovakia by 1934. The young nation watched on helplessly when, on the 30th of September 1938, Germany, Great Britain, France and Italy signed the Munich Agreement. This ceded large swathes of Czech land to Germany, including the Sudetenland, which had a large population of ethnic Germans. Adolf Hitler was not appeased and so continued to absorb more territory and installed a Nazi puppet state in the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. On the 1st of September 1939, the Nazis invaded Poland and thus began World War II. The crackdown on Jews in Czechoslovakia was severe, with the Kucher family moving when Karl was just four years old from Bratislava to Prague, where they thought they may blend in among the more cosmopolitan society. Karl's mother Irena spent the entirety of the war holed up in the family apartment and managed to evade the Nazis. Her parents and two brothers were not as lucky, perishing in the Nazi concentration camps. The liberation of Czechoslovakia began in mid-1944, with the Soviets establishing a provisional Czechoslovak government in April of 1945. As the Soviets moved in, Czechoslovakia was a country ripe for the ideological taking. Karl Kutcher, who was 11 years old by this time, had already learned to speak English in addition to his native Czech. Even from this early age, he started to get into trouble. He, along with some other students in his class, protested against the hanging of Stalin's portrait in the classrooms. For this, he was expelled. But since communism had not yet exerted its stranglehold on society, Karl and his peers were allowed back after a successful appeal. In 1949, Karl began attending a French-speaking school in Prague, and it wasn't long before he was fluent in French. While intelligent and diligent, he had a definite anti-authoritarian streak, which came to the fore when he and a group of his classmates conspired in November 1949 to overthrow the communist regime. This was a lofty ambition for a small group of 15-year-old boys, 
but they nevertheless sought to procure some firearms for the job. The teenage boys, however, were oblivious to the fact that one in their number was an informer for the STB, the Czech State Security Agency responsible for all intelligence and counterintelligence, both domestic and foreign. When the STB caught wind of the boys' plans, the group was promptly arrested. After a thorough interrogation, the boys were released without charge, the authorities perhaps recognizing that teenage boys sometimes get up to mischief. While he managed to avoid prison, young Carl now had an STB file opened in his name. This would haunt him for decades and set in motion his later life as a spy. Czechoslovakia was a country rapidly falling into the hands of the Soviet Communist Party. Stalinist-style political purges were common and currency reform decimated the savings of countless Czech families. But then, with the death of Joseph Stalin on the 5th of March 1953, there was a glimmer of hope. Through his economic, social and political reforms, new Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev released millions of political prisoners from Soviet prisons and secretly denounced Joseph Stalin to party members during his speech at the 20th Congress of the Communist Party. Times in Czechoslovakia remained tough, with President Antonin Zarpototsky remaining an ardent follower of Stalinism, even erecting the world's largest statue of the man in Prague in 1955. In 1960, the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic was born. With that, its political and ideological transformation was complete. Back on the home front, Karl clashed often with his father, Jaroslav. He was evidently a hard man and routinely denigrated his son. The family was not well off, Jaroslav being forced into early retirement from his position at the post office and the family surviving off a single meager pension. To earn his keep, Karl began working as a tour guide in Prague from age 15. He was by then fluent in Czech, English, French and Russian. His language and storytelling abilities served him well and he relished the opportunity to exercise his creative streak, something that his father did not encourage. After graduating from his French high school with top marks in 1953, Karl applied to study at the prestigious Charles University, but strangely, his application was rejected. He applied for a second time with the same result. Only after his third application later that year in 1953 was he accepted to study mathematics and physics, subjects chosen for him by his father. Evidently, Karl Kucher's STB file, which marked him as a troublemaker, was harming his future career prospects and social standing. Karl nevertheless pursued his studies diligently, enrolling also in the Prague Academy during the last year of his studies at Charles University, where he studied film theory and script writing. Karl also wrote part-time for Czechoslovakia television and taught science and maths at a vocational high school, eventually being appointed an assistant professor of mathematics at the Czechoslovakia Institute of Technology. Karl had by then spent seven years working as a tour guide in Prague. He received a call one day from a professor who worked in the philosophy department at Columbia University in the United States. It was a phone call that would change Karl's life forever. Professor George Klein had been told that Karl spoke good English and wanted to know whether Karl could be his guide as he toured the country studying Czech and Eastern European literature. Karl accepted the offer and what solidified the relationship between the two men was when Karl took Klein to see the grave of Franz Kafka, a still obscure Czech author whose work wouldn't find international recognition for many years to come. Klein introduced Karl to a new world of people and ideas he seldom encountered in Czechoslovakia, instilling in him a desire to see and experience what the world had to offer beyond the Iron Curtain. To this end, Karl Kucher applied to join a teaching group that was due to travel to Mali. While he was accepted into the program, he was denied a passport. Then, after he won a competition through UNESCO to teach in Cameroon, his passport was again denied. Karl's suspicions about his record with the STB would only be confirmed years later. He had been blacklisted for travel outside of Czechoslovakia. In an attempt to clean up his record, 
Karl applied for membership with the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia in 1960. A friend had convinced him that this was a good idea, arguing that if Karl could not beat them, he may as well join them. Frustrated, yet intent on not giving up, Karl successfully applied in 1962 to work as a comedy writer for Czechoslovakia Radio. The opportunity would, however, be short-lived, after Karl got into a spat with an undercover STB agent after a night out on the town. Karl was approached by the STB agent after he was seen kissing his date goodnight on her doorstep. An argument ensued, with Karl being reported over the incident and later convicted of committing criminal activity of a moral character. Following an appeal, Karl was sentenced to two years probation. This was enough for him to be fired from his job at the radio station. This put Karl in a difficult position, for to be unemployed in Czechoslovakia was in fact a felony at the time. He was eventually able to find work as a night watchman at a construction yard. He moved between jobs for a period, teaching at a planetarium and then working as an agricultural labourer. For a man of Karl Kucher's intellect and ambition, he was never going to be satisfied with that kind of life. In 1962, Karl contacted a friend from his former film school whom he knew to be working for his arch nemesis, the STB. Working within the counterintelligence division, Jan Lischke's job was to snoop on actors and filmmakers who were considered soft targets for enemy recruitment. Lischke withdrew Karl's file from STB records and saw that it contained a thorough accounting of all of Karl's past indiscretions. Karl's suspicions as to why he could never seem to get ahead in life were then confirmed. The two friends gave the matter some thought. Applying for party membership hadn't been enough to clear Karl's record. Yet, if he could be employed by the very organization harassing and holding him back, maybe then he could arrange for his record to be expunged. It was a plan so crazy, it might just work. Karl began joining his friend Jan Lischke at the bars and cafes frequented by the local STB agents. Slowly, he began to ingratiate himself his comrades soon realizing that the former professor and polyglot may be of use to the agency. It's not clear exactly when he was recruited, but for the next three years, Coral was given extensive training in spycraft, including secret communications, detecting and avoiding surveillance, and how to pass polygraph tests. Coral Kucher, anti-authoritarian as he may have been, had just signed up to become a small cog in the colossal Soviet machine. Coral continued working as a labourer in the agricultural sector, which he knew would serve as an aid in his ongoing rehabilitation. One night in 1963, during a party held in the warehouse where he worked, Coral laid eyes on Hana Pardamsova. Coral was instantly besotted with the young woman ten years his junior. Not only was she strikingly beautiful, but he soon learned that she came from a family with good communist credentials. Hana's father joined the party in 1945 and climbed the ranks to become the head of a local party branch and later a senior member of the Communist Party's national infrastructure. The feelings were mutual, and within three months of meeting, the couple were married in November of 1963. Hana knew about Karl's training and association with the STB, and both had their sights set on travelling abroad for their first big assignment. Soon enough, Karl and Hana got their big break. They had earned enough trust with the STB to be asked to travel to the USA to pose as dissident refugees. Once in America, their goal was to ensconce themselves within the artistic, journalistic and scientific circles of the eastern United States. From there, they would attempt to work their way into security organizations and gain access to classified materials to feed back to their Czech handlers. If this plan sounds simplistic, it was. Karl and Hana were being treated as guinea pigs in the STB's first attempt to deploy a sleeper agent behind enemy lines. There was not much of a plan apart from getting the couple to the USA and then seeing what they could do. Travelling from behind the Iron Curtain to the West during the Cold War 
was no simple task. Fortunately, Hana had an uncle living in Austria. Uncle Joseph was going to be their gateway to the West. On the 11th of September 1965, Carl and Hana traveled to Austria. They traveled light, taking with them almost nothing except the clothes on their backs and a bar of soap containing a hidden set of cipher codes needed to communicate with the STB. As a staunch communist and party member, Hana's father was indoctrinated into the operation. He served as the conduit through which Hana would communicate by sending coded messages on postcards. As part of the plan, Coral had confided during a visit from Professor George Klein that he and Hana intended to defect. He of course did not tell him of his true mission. Ironically, Klein was strongly suspected by the STB, and Coral for that matter, of working for American intelligence. Once in Austria, Coral and Hana presented themselves at the American Embassy, which had been tipped off to their arrival by Klein and sought asylum in America. The beauty of Coral's cover story was that it was more or less true. His record with the STB that had plagued him his entire life now served another purpose. Credibility in the eyes of the West. Coral and Hana were granted asylum and on the 5th of December 1965, they boarded a charter flight arranged by the American Fund for Czechoslovak Refugees. They were bound for America and would soon start their mission. Back in Prague, the STB were left wondering whether they had made the right decision in selecting Coral as their subject. The agency was aware of his progressive views and, of course, his history of run-ins with the law. They also knew that he had a violent temper, was emotionally volatile, and was primarily driven by money. Only time would tell if they had made the right choice. It didn't take long for Coral and Hana to start building their new life in New York. Both soon found jobs which allowed the couple to rent an apartment on 55th Street near 8th Avenue and to purchase a used Chevy vehicle. Hana worked for Harry Winston's famed 5th Avenue jewelry store Sorting Diamonds. Coral, again through his relationship with Professor George Klein, secured a position working at Radio Free Europe. This was a radio station run by the CIA which broadcast pro-American news and political analysis to the Eastern Bloc. To the Soviets, Radio Free Europe was propaganda enemy number one. It was popular among students and intelligentsia, and the USSR would have wanted nothing more than to stamp it out completely. Having a man behind enemy lines, they hoped would prove useful in getting information on RFE's staff, who consisted of many dissidents and second-generation Soviet emigres. Coral, however, refused to inform on his colleagues at the radio station. His STB handlers were routinely frustrated by the dearth of information he supplied, and what he did share they found not to be particularly useful. Coral's persistent refusal to cooperate in this area remained a bone of contention between him and the STB for years. Coral Kucher's handler during this initial phase of his deployment was Miroslav Polreich, an STB agent operating under diplomatic cover, working out of the United Nations. Miroslav and Coral met from month to month, with Coral being paid a few hundred dollars on each occasion. Coral was, however, still very much a sleeper agent, biding his time until he managed to burrow his way into the depths of American intelligence. In 1966, with his sights still set on finding his way into the fold of American academia, Coral applied for and was granted a fellowship to study at Indiana University. Coral and Hana thus packed their things and moved to Bloomington, Indiana in September of 1966. Bloomington was no Manhattan, and so by springtime the following year, Coral and Hana were angling to move back to New York. George Klein proved useful once again, introducing Coral to a professor at Columbia University. And so, after spending two semesters at Indiana, Coral was offered and accepted a position working at Columbia's Russian Institute while he studied for his PhD. This was a think tank headed by Zygmunt Brzezinski, a prominent Polish-American who would later serve as counselor to US President Lyndon B. Johnson. Coral was certainly surrounding himself with influential people. 
Despite their clear progress, the Kuchers were feeling the financial pinch, and this caused strain on their relationship. Their jobs didn't pay that well, and they felt leagues behind Carl's peers in academia who had old money backing them up. Little did the Kuchers know that events in their home country of Czechoslovakia would soon add to their woes. In January 1968, Alexander Dubček was elected as the first secretary of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia. This was seen by the people as a hopeful sign for change following years of growing dissatisfaction among Czechoslovaks over economic difficulties and the lack of political freedoms. Dubček's desire was to introduce socialism with a human face. He wanted to democratize the government and increase freedom of the press, speech and travel. He also had his sights set on a more decentralized economy. All these ambitions represented a significant departure from the strict Soviet-style control that characterized the Eastern Bloc. Dubček's policy of reform, called his Action Program, was viewed with deep suspicion by the Soviet Union and other Warsaw Pact nations. They feared the spread of liberal-minded ideas to their own countries. The tension reached its peak when, in the late hours of the 20th of August 1968, the Soviet Union, along with forces from Poland, Hungary, East Germany and Bulgaria, invaded Czechoslovakia. The invasion was met with widespread non-violent resistance from the Czechoslovak population, but what became referred to as the Prague Spring was quickly snuffed out. The aftermath of the Soviet invasion was a period of normalization during which the status quo was restored. Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev removed Dubček from office and engaged in a wholesale purge of government officials and employees, most of whom were replaced by hardline Soviet-style communist lackeys. On the global stage, the West condemned the invasion seeing exactly how low Soviet tolerance was for any kind of social and political reform. The Cold War divide deepened as Soviet satellite states realized, whether they liked it or not, they were beholden to their superpower Soviet overlords. Back in New York, Carl watched on with disgust. Describing himself in a later interview as a Czech patriot, Carl's primary national loyalty was to Czechoslovakia and his Slovak people not the Soviet Union. He hated the regime that invaded his country and cared even less to work with anyone installed as part of the new Soviet puppet regime in Czechoslovakia. Karl's STB handler was one such victim of these purges, being replaced by a new man loyal to the KGB. Karl Kucher lost virtually all motivation to continue his work for the STB. He considered defecting, this time genuinely, and to tell all to the FBI. In 1969, he quit his job at Radio Free Europe after the program that he was working on was cancelled. After months of lying low and avoiding contact with his handlers, Carl received a signal to meet with the STB on the 30th of March 1970. Carl did not pitch for the meeting, nor did he the next day at a pre-agreed backup date. For the next few months, Carl went to ground. It was only on the 10th of October 1970 that Carl finally agreed to meet with his new handler. The meeting at the Continental Restaurant did not go as the STB expected, with Carl flying into a rage, yelling at his new handler and threatening him. Despite the fiery encounter, the two men agreed to meet again a few months later. Carl was given a shopping list of documents and information that his bosses wanted to get their hands on. Whether Coral produced the goods would be a true test of his loyalty, which the STB at that point was starting to seriously doubt. In December 1970, when Coral arrived at the next meeting empty-handed, the STB began to lose all hope in their agent. They even considered plans to take him down or sabotage his life in the USA. During this tense period, Coral even paid a visit to the FBI in November and told them that he had been approached by Czech intelligence. Karl reasoned that if he came clean and offered to turn double agent, he would avoid prosecution and be allowed to remain in the US. The FBI, being more interested in the Mafia at that point in time, didn't take Karl up on his offer and took no further action. 
On the 21st of September 1971, Carl became a naturalized United States citizen. Hanna's application was delayed given her firm family links to the Czech Communist Party, but her citizenship was granted the following year. While the STB considered how best to cut off their agent for good, they had no idea that Carl was on the verge of his biggest break yet. Growing increasingly frustrated with his job prospects, Carl visited the job placement office at Columbia University, where he expressed an interest in working for the US government. Given his proficiency in Czech and Russian, it was suggested that he apply to join the CIA. And so, in April 1972, and armed with letters of recommendation from Klein and Brzezinski, this is exactly what Carl did. The CIA was desperate to find men like Carl who spoke Russian and other Eastern European languages, and he was thus a shoo-in for a position. Apart from the regular interview process, there was one other small hurdle to overcome. A polygraph test. But for a man like Carl, this was no big issue. He was a physicist by profession and had been trained by the STB to pass lie detector tests through control of his physiological responses to questioning. Coral took the test and passed with flying colors. In February 1973, Coral Kucher moved to Washington DC where he began working for a secretive branch of the CIA's Soviet East European Division. There he was tasked with listening to recordings of secretly taped conversations between the CIA's Soviet targets. Given his ongoing uneasy relationship with the STB, Carl hadn't even told his handlers the reason for his move to Washington. Czech intelligence was rather stunned when they found out, and word quickly filtered up the chain of command to the KGB. Suddenly, there was a lot of interest in Carl Kucher. The STB had to face the fact that, as volatile as their agent was, he had managed, entirely on his own, to infiltrate the Central Intelligence Agency. Against all odds, Carl Kutcher had succeeded, and the STB's sleeper agent was about to be activated. With his top-secret security clearance, Carl began to feed critical information back to his handlers. He told them that the KGB station chief in Beirut was being monitored, that Czechoslovakia's military mission in West Berlin was being actively watched, and that four different phone lines had been tapped by the CIA at the Soviet Embassy in Bogota. After listening to and translating dozens of conversations from these tapped phone lines, Coral learned that the CIA was attempting to recruit a Soviet diplomat stationed in Bogota. In 1973, Alexander Ogorodnik had been enjoying his time away from Moscow in Latin America, perhaps just a little bit too much. He had just found out that his Colombian mistress was pregnant, and his bosses were going to be none too pleased when they found out. Through a joint Colombian intelligence and CIA operation, Ogorodnik was recruited as a spy for the West. Codenamed Trigon, Ogorodnik was soon recalled to Moscow to take up a position in the Global Affairs Department of the Soviet Foreign Ministry. The CIA was thrilled to have an agent working for them in the heart of the Soviet Union. His case was run by Martha Marty Peterson, the first woman to serve as a case officer in the CIA's Moscow station. Ogorodnik was arrested in July 1977 after the KGB got wind of a dead drop exchange arranged with Peterson. During his interrogation, Ogorodnik bit down on a pen supplied to him by the CIA. Inside was a cyanide capsule. Within seconds, he was dead. A later investigation into the compromised operation revealed that translations of Agent Trigon's report from Russian into English had been prepared by none other than Coral Kutcher. Whether he appreciated it or not, there was a very real human cost to the work that Kutcher was doing. Having outed a Soviet double agent, Coral knew exactly how much his position at the CIA was worth not only to the STB, but to the organization pulling its strings that had much deeper pockets. He used this as a bargaining chip to demand much more compensation from the KGB. Hana was no mere passenger in her husband's duplicitous dealings. She had chosen to remain in New York to continue her work in the diamond trade. She was earning a good living of $20,000 per year working for Savion Diamonds, but also became a courier for her husband. 
meeting with STB agents and receiving payments and cash for documents and information that she handed over. Her job as a diamond dealer, which required extensive travel all over the world, provided excellent cover for her many trips overseas. Coral was eager to return to New York City, which she did in the summer of 1975 after accepting a transfer to the CIA's Office of Political Research where he worked on a contract basis, earning $12,000 a year. In their endless pursuit of wealth and status, Coral continuously demanded more money from the Soviets. He argued that he couldn't fit in unless he was on an equal financial footing with his colleagues and contemporaries. Coral was paid another $20,000, which he used in January 1976 to make a down payment on an apartment at the luxurious Park Regis building on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Life was going well for the Kuchers by this stage. They had fully assimilated into their new American lives, were earning good money, and Carl was the STB and the KGB's golden boy. The couple, however, took their hedonistic lifestyle to extreme levels. Theirs was a life fueled by materialism. Money, drugs, and sex were the orders of the day. From around the time that Carl started working for the CIA in Virginia, he and Hana began to attend sex parties together on the weekends. They became active swingers and partied hard among the social and political elites from Washington to New York. The couple would attend these parties weekly at such venues with names like Plato's Retreat, The Hellfire, The Swinging Gate, and Capital Couples. These extramural activities were in addition to the many holidays that Carl and Hannah took together, both at home in the US and in Europe. Carl also became a fitness fanatic. If he wasn't out jogging, he could be found training at the Young Men's Hebrew Association gym on 92nd Street. Carl's life as a spy was soaring to new heights. As he became more senior in his role at the CIA, he was being asked not just to translate recordings and reports, but also to provide his own political analysis of the documents he translated. What had started as a gamble by an inexperienced Czechoslovakian spy agency was paying major dividends. Coral's success was so prolific that reports of his activities had come across the desk of Oleg Kalugin, the KGB's head of foreign counterintelligence. He was, in essence, one of the KGB's top spy catchers. There was, however, one small catch. Oleg Kalugin was rumored to secretly be working for the CIA. In August of 1976, Karl and Hanna arranged to meet with the STB in Austria while holidaying in Europe. When they arrived, they were told that they were being recalled to Czechoslovakia for further meetings. Once there, Coral was taken to an STB safe house in a small village outside Prague where he was confronted by Kalugin. For hours, he was put through the ringer, being interrogated about his every movement since landing on American shores. By the end of the session, Coral was given an ultimatum, appear on Czech TV to admit to espionage and denounce the CIA, or be cut loose. Coral refused point blank saying that if he was not allowed to return to the USA, people would come looking for him. He and Hana were, after all, American citizens. The two spies had reached a stalemate. Carl and Hana were reluctantly allowed by the KGB to return to the United States, but their lives had been turned firmly upside down. Returning to Moscow, Kalugin wrote a report denouncing Carl as an American spy, Kalugin was powerful enough within the KGB apparatus for his decision to be taken as final. Now cut off from their handlers, Hana continued working in the diamond trade and Coral returned to a quiet life of academia after his contract with the CIA came to an end. For the next five years, the Kuchers lived, perhaps for the very first time since arriving in America, an honest life. By the beginning of the 1980s, Oleg Kalugin's power was starting to erode. Rumors circulated about the possibility of him being a traitor, and he was demoted to deputy head of the Leningrad KGB. As the Soviet intelligence world began to lose faith in their former general, questions started to arise about some of the decisions he made along the way. Viewed with fresh eyes, 
Kalugin's interrogation and denouncement of Karl Kutcher in 1976 started to be seen in a new light. The STB realized how they were squandering one of their most valuable, albeit volatile, illegal agents. In May 1981, KGB head Yuri Andropov launched Operation Ryan. This was a Soviet military intelligence program designed to establish evidence of plans by America for a nuclear first strike against the Soviet Union. The new Reagan administration did little to quell Soviet fears, with Ronald Reagan's Star Wars speech in 1983 sending tensions to new heights. The Soviets needed all information on the ground as they could gather, and so plans were soon put in place to try and patch things up with Coral. An STB agent by the name of Jan Fiele was tasked with reactivating Coral as an agent. He was a face familiar to Hana, who had met the man on occasion in previous handover meetings. He travelled to the USA in 1982 and re-established contact with Coral. Bored and unfulfilled, Coral Kutcher didn't hesitate to accept Jan Fiele's offer. Coral managed to secure for himself a job working for the political campaign team of New York gubernatorial candidate Louis Lerman. He was thus making important contacts in Republican circles and had keen insights on the developing political situation in America. As pleased as Coral was to have resumed his work as a spy, he was getting anxious. From the conspicuous man with binoculars across the street to the strange occasional clicking sound on his home telephone and the guy Coral kept bumping into at the gym, he was convinced that he was being watched. Hana had become so concerned about surveillance that she stopped working as a courier entirely by October 1983. By January 1984, Coral followed suit, communicating the end of his cooperation with the STB by sending a message to Prague. Coral and Hana's concerns of compromise were such that they had for some months been planning an exit from the United States. In November of 1984, they sold their Manhattan apartment, transferring the proceeds to a bank account in Zurich in anticipation of a move to Austria. Their concerns about surveillance were valid. For some months, the FBI had been watching Coral and Hana. Through routine surveillance by the FBI's counterintelligence squad, Coral began to make a regular appearance among the various Czech nationals the FBI had on its watch list. It is believed also that Jan Fiele, who recruited Coral, had in fact been working for the CIA at the time. Fiele suddenly disappeared without trace, possibly into the CIA's witness protection program. The KGB's official position was that Oleg Kalugin had betrayed Coral Kucher. On the 15th of November 1984, the Kuchers left a meeting at the bank following the sale of their apartment. Coral walked Hana to her office in the Diamond Club building on 47th Street and escorted her inside. A few minutes later, he exited the building, alone. He then spotted a familiar face. It was the man he kept seeing at the gym. The man caught his eye and walked directly up to Coral, hand outstretched. I have some friends that would like to speak to you, the man said. Coral knew immediately that he was looking into the eyes of an FBI agent. While he knew he wasn't under arrest, Coral thought better of declining the man's invitation. A car pulled up, and Coral climbed in. Coral was driven to a nearby hotel and taken up to a suite overlooking Central Park. This was a joint CIA-FBI operation. Coral was told to take a seat, and the questioning began immediately. Hana, they said, had also been picked up and was being questioned in another room. Despite being subjected to many hours of questioning and being directly accused of being a Soviet spy, Coral maintained his nerve. If the FBI and CIA's intention was to extract a confession from Coral, they were not going to succeed. Having no direct evidence of espionage, the agents had no choice but to let Coral and Hana go later that day. Coral did, however, agree to meet again with the CIA and FBI but further interviews yielded little more for the investigators. Eventually, Coral was offered a deal by the CIA. Confess to his espionage and cooperate fully with the investigation, in which case he would eventually be allowed to leave the country a free man, 
or face prosecution and potentially spend the rest of his life behind bars. Self-preservation kicked in and Carl took the deal. After providing a confession of sorts, the Kuchers were scheduled to leave the United States for good, bound for Austria. On the 27th of November 1984, it was arranged that the FBI would drive the couple to the airport. Instead, reneging on the deal offered them by the CIA, the FBI arrested Carl Kutcher for espionage and detained Hana as a material witness. Carl was locked up in New York's Metropolitan Correctional Center. Although he knew he faced the possibility of a life sentence, or even worse, capital punishment, he also knew that investigators didn't have much dirt on him. As the matter wore on, Hana ended up spending four months in jail after being charged with contempt of court for refusing to testify before a grand jury. She was released pending an appeal. The handling of the Kucher case serves as a lesson in how to bungle an operation. The confession that Carl had provided as part of his deal with the CIA was tainted and would not be admissible in court. Without the confession, investigators had little more than circumstantial evidence. Prosecutors were nevertheless under pressure to take the matter to trial, and so Carl languished in jail while he awaited his day in court. Running out of options, Carl devised a cunning plan. Through his lawyer, he wrote a letter to the head of the KGB, Vladimir Krychov. Carl proposed that he be traded for Nathan Sharansky. If that name is not familiar to you now, it would have been in the mid-1980s. Nathan Sharansky was the world's most famous political prisoner at the time, having been detained in Russia after attempting to immigrate to Israel in 1973. In 1977, he was imprisoned on charges of espionage. In reality, he was no spy. He just had a knack for exposing the corruption and cruelty of the Soviet Union. He was a dissident and a global symbol of resistance. It was a bold call for Carl to think that the KGB would agree to exchange him for their most high-profile prisoner. Even Carl's lawyer was doubtful, considering his client at the time to be nothing more than a second-rate spy. The gamble, however, paid off. Whether the KGB truly valued Carl Kucher as one of their most effective spies, or merely saw the exchange of Sharansky as a public relations and propaganda stunt, we will never know. What we do know is that arrangements were soon made for a grand prisoner swap along the famous Glinica Bridge. For American prosecutors, the prisoner exchange was to be the silver lining on an otherwise very dark cloud. Put simply, Coral's investigation and prosecution had been botched. There was very little prospect of prosecutors actually securing a conviction. At least in a prisoner exchange, they would get something out of the whole fiasco. As part of the deal, Carl pleaded guilty to espionage charges on the 3rd of February 1986 and was compelled to accept a life sentence, commuted to actual time served. Both he and Hana forfeit their American passports and were declared persona non grata. After the formalities were out of the way, the two Czech spies were flown from New York to Frankfurt and then travelled to Berlin for the swap. Carl, wearing a pair of Gucci loafers and a tailored Brooks Brothers suit, and Hana, wearing a black fur coat and white fur hat, strutted across the bridge as cameras snapped away. Sharansky crossed the bridge in the other direction, along with various other political prisoners swapped that day. Carl and Hana entered the gold Mercedes-Benz owned by famed spy lawyer Wolfgang Vogel and were soon whisked away across the border. Carl and Hanna received a hero's welcome when they returned to Prague. They were given a house and a new Volvo as a reward, and Carl soon secured a position working at the Prague Institute for Economic Forecasting. Hanna started working as a translator for the British Embassy in Prague. Eventually, however, her employer caught wind of her former life as a spy, and she was terminated. Carl and Hanna's acclaim as national heroes did not survive the fall of the Soviet Union. As the hammer and sickle flag was slowly lowered from the Kremlin on Christmas Day 1991, the Kuchers became nothing more than relics of a former era. Carl and Hanna remain living in the Czech Republic in relative obscurity today. 
their humdrum existence a far cry from their hedonism fueled lives of old. Ultimately, Carl Kutcher was left questioning whether, in the grand scheme of things, anything he did truly made any difference. That, that's it. I mean, a man's life, okay, so it was exciting in a way, but you want to see uh, as you could all, it was some, some accomplishment, you really made a difference. I don't know, what, what a difference did I make? What did I accomplish? I don't know if I would do it again. <laughs>